So my name is Matt Rhodes, um, Alan already mentioned. I'm an application engineer. I focus on the polyspace code verification products, but I dabble in some of the other model verification and validation products we have as well. Uh, today, I'm going to try and give you an overview of the whole process with respect to high integrity software. Um, I'll try and not pick on my stuff too much so that you can have, if you have questions about those things though, uh, come out to the booth afterwards and we can talk about those specifics. My colleague uh, Aussie is here with me today too. Uh, he's leaving tomorrow, so if you have questions for him, uh, you know, we should probably talk to him today. But between the two of us, if you have any questions uh, that we can't answer, uh, we'll make sure to get you to the right people as well. All right. So, oh, actually, before I jump into this, real quick, quick show of hands. How many of you in here are already using some part of model-based design with Simulink and modeling already? Just show of hands. I'm curious. Uh, all right, raise raise them high so it's easy to see. Um, all right, anybody uh, who's seen it and thinking about it? All right, anybody? Um, who are just too lazy to raise their hands. Raise it now. <laughs> All, right. All right, I know a lot of you have done it. Uh, in the past, you know, we've talked, you know, I've heard plenty of people from this audience talking about what they've done and showing examples using these tools and that they're working together. Uh, I know Karen Gundy Burlett, before she retired, did several presentations on the success of the Laddie program using model-based design, and in particular, uh, my favorite, Polyspace, using that successfully, uh, a successful mission got off for that as well. Um, I'll have some other examples for you as well, but anyway, without further ado. Um, so some data also to go with you. So from, this, this is from a venture development corporation, some information about how the, uh, um, the, the various things that cause people to miss, miss their deadlines. So unrealistic schedules, unrealistic, uh, you know, overly complex systems, changes to the specification as you go, um, all byproducts of not doing good system engineering and development uh, against the requirements as you go. All, all things that model-based design help take care of early on in the process. All right? uh, this is uh, Bowman Basili. Uh, this is so old that if you haven't seen it, it's because it is so old, but it's a classic example of why it's so important to take care of issues in your systems earlier in the process. And it comes down to cost. Basically what it's showing you is that the cost for a problem in the requirements phase is much cheaper than the design phase and the price more than doubles at that point. The cost going from design to coding, again, doubling, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, more recently, uh, some data uh, a report from, I forget where that's come from, from EDA, TechBright, uh, they basically confirmed the same finding independently that in order of magnitude more to fix a problem later stages in each stage of development as you go. Yet that's where we're still finding all the problems is later in development. So there's, there's really no reason to be allowing that. We have tools that can help you find and take care of things sooner in the process, okay? Uh, and so model-based design uh, whether you're using it just at a lower level of rigor or a, a full-on D178 level of rigor uh, like you might for uh, space flight systems, the biggest thing it's going to help you with is the verification and validation, making sure that the biggest savings you have is around automation against requirements and, and testing against those as well. The uh, design and coding phases, you know, just because you're generating code doesn't mean you're having a ton of savings there. You do have a little bit, but the big savings is in the verification and validation. So any of you who have already adopted model-based design, uh, you might have seen this already from some of my colleagues. This is the model-based design maturity, uh, also known as, referred to as the adoption grid. And basically what you have is up the left axis is adopting for modeling and simulation. Along the bottom is all about generating code, going towards production, and basically as you add capability to your system, the, the big point is that uh, the further up to the top right corner you go, the more return on investment you're going to get. All right. So with that in mind, let's just go ahead and step back and look at the whole process. We're going to start with the 
the overall systems of systems and step in and we're going to focus on the software uh, from there. But I want to make sure that it's in perspective as we go in so we don't get confused on where we're at. <coughs> so a system to system view. The requirements or the concept of operations, the conops, uh, you're going to have your system analysis going on, the system engineering work, your descriptions and architectures uh, from whatever organizations are working together to make sure that your overall system is targeting what it needs to do. And along the right side, you see the, the sweep of the system, the system, system verification uh, going down to the individual systems. All those requirements get allocated to the various subsystems effectively, whether it be ground stations, aircraft, whatever. Just taking a quick swipe, let's look at the aircraft for a second. So if we go down to the uh, sub subsystem workflow, uh, thinking about ARP 4754A, uh, you, know, you have your aircraft requirements getting validated and that goes against the verification. You have the, at the system level, you have the individual systems with their own requirements and verifications going against the system level verification. And you drop down to the items uh, that are comprising that as well. Okay, so now we're gonna go into one of those so that we can talk about the, so the software itself. And in a workflow that, that you would use for DO178, using some modeling, uh, you, you're gonna have your requirements. Of course, you're gonna have to validate those, okay? Pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm trying to go through this quick so we can put in the pieces where we need to be. Um, you trace to your design, make sure that your requirements are in place, the conformance of those design to the requirements. Design verification is gonna happen against the requirements as well, and you're gonna make sure there's compliance against those uh, verifications uh, designed to the uh, requirements as well. Then you're gonna have the next level for the source code, conformance for the source code, uh, you know, coding rules, et cetera, uh, with compliance. All the way down to the object code where you're gonna have to do compliance verification as well. And so you have your requirements going across to the object code for the individual systems as you go on. All right, so with model-based design, there's really only one real difference against this picture, and I'll show you where all the different tools fit in, we can tie some better examples. So really it's just, if you look back, that's the, the design really is your model, okay? So you wanna make sure that all the pieces that are, that are key to the implementation are, are, are being described into that as you go. And we have various tools to help with that. So, the simulated verification and validation, the requirements management interface we have there, uh, allows you to make sure that the requirements you have are, are linked directly to those parts of your design in the model itself. Uh, pr pretty straightforward for those of you who've already done it, this is pretty common. You've already seen the you know, simulating and state flow for uh, modeling your system's behaviors and simulating report generator is also used for some of the, uh, the qualification process if you're doing a DO. In fact, you'll notice asterisks as we go along on these various uh, tools. The ones that are qualifiable tools for the DO process are marked with an asterisk as we go. So just as an example, it's a little hard to see up there. Uh, there's a state flow chart, and here we're showing where there's a block of state that is missing requirements mapped to it. So you can early on in your process see where requirements are missing, or so maybe somebody's implement a design that doesn't have a valid requirement to justify its existence. But you can find these problems early in the process at the model level before you wind up moving along to the next phase. Right? Uh, oftentimes this is indicative of, of misinterpreting requirements. That's uh, an important thing to do. For those of you who do simulation uh, with, your, with your systems, uh, this is a shipping example that we have and the on the right is actually a, a visualization. You have all kinds of rich environments you can get. Some of you, I'm pretty sure, make some of your own for visualizing the systems you're working with. Uh, flightgear.org, you can download this one, and this uh, HL20 vehicle system is also something you can actually, it's a shipping example, it's pretty handy. Uh, and so this is this, uh, inside the controller or the block systems that are involved in that for the landing of the system, actually. All right, so once you've, once you've done the, the requirements tracing to the, to the model, making sure your design is uh, up to snuff in terms of uh, covering what the system needs to do, 
You can also use a, the model advisor to make sure that modeling standards are, are complied with to make sure that there aren't going to be issues as a result of how you model. And the uh, model advisor, in conjunction with the verification and validation, uh, simulate verification and validation systems, uh, they provide some DO and 7 8 model advisor checks as well that can be very useful for uh, making sure that the things you need to do at the model level that are going to impact you later on are, are done along the way. So here's a, uh, a screenshot of the, the model advisor with all the various checks available in it. Um, the topic is the D178. I, I pulled the wrong side. I, uh, here I'm highlighting ISO 26262, which is an automotive uh, 5012 on, on rail, uh, railroad, uh, rail systems. So I suppose if you wanted to put a satellite on a railroad tracks or on a vehicle on a highway, you could. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, we have all the standards available for you for all, whatever process you need to follow. Uh, right, right, in, right, in, right in there for uh, model visor checks. Also, uh, compliance level is a uh, simulated design verifier, design error detection. Here we actually have on the model itself, we're not talking about generated code, we're talking about on the model design error detection. So this is actually based upon some technology that is in the tool that I work primarily, Polyspace, but it's been moved up to the model level. And it's actually pretty cool. Uh, so here you're seeing a state chart that has dead logic in it. So you have to take care of that. You can't have dead logic maintained in your, in your system for DO process at all. Uh, also, uh, other examples, so the, the green blocks here are places where we've proven the absence of errors. So no overflows, uh, no divide by zeros, et cetera, okay? Uh, the red is uh, where problems are proven to occur, okay? Then beyond just the static analysis on the model level, we also have the ability to do dynamic analysis. So the simulating test is uh, testing, has a test manager and framework available uh, for it as well. And uh, to augment just you know, testing you would do with that, there's also uh, the model coverage you can get from simulating verification and validation. Uh, and to augment also with formal methods, you can use the property proving of Simulink Design Verifier. So I'll show you some examples of that in, in a moment. So this one is just a, a, a test example for a time series test. Uh, you have some pass-fail results based upon those input signals, based upon that time series data, okay? Uh, and by the way, you can actually feed a lot of your test sequences with, uh, you'll notice that's an Excel spreadsheet that's giving you your test data. And so, you know, as mentioned before, it's handy to be able to automate a lot of this rather than having to go build things up by hand. You already have a lot of your data in Excel from analysis, and so you can go and use that kind of inputs to feed your test cases, okay? Uh, here you see a, 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 a test harness with a test sequence input block and a, a test assessment block. And these are actually you know, written MATLAB code here for the, the uh, inputs and the output assessments that you would need for that. And then for some of the formal methods we were talking about, uh, you know, some various examples of property proofs where you have some inputs uh, and some, you know, con some conditions you're going to be looking for and to show, for instance, in this case, that you know, if average speed is greater than 150 knots, then deploy cannot be true for, uh, for this thrust reverser. Um, you know, another example for various property proofs you might do on a system. This is coming from Design Verifier. And you could automate this. You know, one of the most valuable aspects of all this tooling is the automation you can do. Uh, and so you can automate this kind of thing with your test manager through simulating tests as well if you want. Uh, and by the way, when one of those property proofs fails, we'll also provide you a counterexample showing you uh, the data for when uh, it's failing, so you can go back and recreate, adjust your design appropriately based upon that counterexample. And then the other uh, bit you're going to have to do with DO process is being able to get uh, uh, coverage of your system for you know, showing that you have complete testing coverage, uh, not only at the model level, but you know, also at the object code level. So it's good to, do, to be able to start off at model level doing that and then get down to the next level with the uh, 
something else I'll show you in a second, getting ahead of myself. Um, but you can actually, actually, after you have all the tests you're trying to get done against your requirements, you can do top off testing uh, and we'll actually, we'll actually generate uh, some uh, tests for you to confirm that your system is fully tested. Right, so th this, one's, this one's not, uh, and in fact, you see that reflected in the reports you get for the, uh, the you know, MCDC coverage, for instance, is down around less than 30% done completely <coughs> at this point. But you can get the reports to see exactly where you're at as you go. And so something I'm going to emphasize again, all that so far has been at the model level. Before you even generate code, you're able to figure out these, any issues you have very early in the process. Okay? Uh, now, of course, when you do go to generate your code, because you want to get credit for a lot of the things that you do at the model level, we have the simulating code inspector is going to allow you to uh, show basically equivalence between the model and the, uh, the source code so that you can get credit for verification at that point. And uh, yeah, so uh, and also we have some static analysis we'll get into to start talking about bug finder for conformance and, and code prover for compliance. Um, and the code inspector also works in the verification level for the, the credits you get there. All right, and so I'm gonna leave my expertise area with one slide just because you can talk to me outside about it more. Uh, but the code prover works in the code level and it is a static analysis tool that's going to prove the absence of errors in your code. Uh, that green at the very top there, the, the proof of absence is the most valuable thing you're going to get from it. Uh, in addition to the fact that it's a qualifiable tool that's going to help you automate a lot of your certification process. The, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to also prove when there are errors that are going to occur systematically so you can address them early on. Uh, we'll find dead code. Uh, and inevitably, all your systems that you're working on aren't going to be completely done with model-based design. You're going to have hand code being integrated in, uh, either uh, on, the ex on the external interfaces or via uh, internal blocks with uh, S functions, et cetera. And we want to make sure that you're able to uh, verify the system combined together as well, integrated together. Uh, and then my favorite is the, uh, the, the orange, which, you know, at a pragmatic level, it's, it's unproven, um, but it, at the same time, it's also showing you where your vulnerabilities in the system are. So that's where, based upon your input conditions, a problem can occur, all right? So whether you're using this early on uh, to help you flesh out how you're going to make your system more robust, or using it to understand uh, what kind of implications you have when you integrate with other systems under different calibration conditions, et cetera, it's a very useful thing to use. And we're also going to do coding rule checks for you as well. So MISRA, JSF++, uh, et cetera. And then beyond that, the object code level, we have facilities to do hardware in the loop integration uh, testing and uh, software in the loop, processor in the loop uh, testing for your object code as well. Okay, And being able to do coverage at that level as well for, for being able to show conformance. So here we see an example of some test vectors going through your simulation and through the, the generated code on, on, the, on the host and doing a comparison to see for uh, equivalency on your, on your results there. Okay. That's a lot. That's, uh, I, I can tell you right now that a lot of that, I, I couldn't tell you all the details you need for all those things. Uh, we have many experts in-house to help with the various parts of this. Um, and we have lots of customers who are uh, you know, able to tell you the successes they already had. Uh, a few of those, uh, you know, Septrino, uh, DO178B process for their GNSS-based uh, landing system. And you know, they were all about the streamlining of the certification process in, in their overall system. I don't like to read slides, so I'm gonna let you read that for a second. Hey, can I interrupt you for just a second? Sure. I, I notice a number of people want to capture the data right away. All of this is gonna be at flightsoftware.org. We will post everything. So just to save your ass. Yep. And, and the videos. 
And, and like I said, uh, th this is not meant to be, a, a, obviously I'm going a little fast through this. I'm trying to save Alan some time for other presenters. I, I would encourage you to come talk to us about specific details that you have, all right? Uh, Eurocopter, another successful qualification with the 178. And they, they actually use this at the high level for the uh, ARP uh, 4754 uh, as well, all the systems coming together. And we have the A380 also, another successful deployment. We want to make sure you're successful also. Uh, and so if you choose to use these tools, if you're already using these tools even, uh, we, we have a, a uh, uh, certification help we have. Uh, the consulting system we have, we have a, a specifically called the Certification Advisory Service. And uh, the, the biggest advantage, I'll just drop to the bottom line, it, it's 30% you know, ROI on the, uh, on the time savings for requirements review, verification, time to flight, 20% uh, reduction. And, and the automation of the certification activities is tremendous. Okay? The other thing that we're going to do, actually, I'll just dive into it. So the this advisory service we provide is a three-phase approach. And the first phase is all about having uh, the, the best practices and providing you some coaching initially. Okay? The, the next phase we're going to get into, if you already are doing some level of model-based design, making sure that you're uh, you know, doing a gap analysis on your process and making sure that the processes you're using are, are in place. Um, well, or if they need to be improved upon, we'll help you come up with an improvement plan for that. And then most importantly, all throughout your process, we want to make sure that you have uh, hands-on help from us so that you're not getting stuck on anything along the way. And that is it in a very tight nutshell. Any questions? So the question was, does Polyspace work on your own code or just the code generated code? And, and the answer simply is that uh, it works on any C, C++, or ADA code that you give it. So you can be combined with hand code, generated code, it doesn't, doesn't matter. As long as it's code that's actually compliant with those languages. Uh, and to that extent, we actually handle a lot of um, aberrations from the, the standards or the languages as well. Other questions? Do you have any APIs or uh, frameworks to plug the generated code back into flight software that actually is running on a real processor? This is where the, the interface is between the generated code and the, and the other code um, is where I think the problem arises. So you're asking about an API to plug the generated code back into? Or, or just an architecture, or, or do you recommend anything in particular, or people just go off and do their own thing every time? Um, I think that would actually be a good question to talk specifically. That's, that's one of those where there's many ways to do it. Um, right. whether, you're, whether you're, I mean, we have lots of APIs available for uh, moving code about. You know, we have our own you know, software and processor in the loop architectures as I briefly alluded to. Um, lots of different uh, ways to handle that. So I, I think I'm going to get some more specifics about what you're trying to do. Any other questions? Okay, thanks Matt. Stop by yeah. and see him. Right.